Welcome to this video. This is part three of basic genetics, and I want to make sure you know the difference between a monohybrid and a dihybrid cross. This is something that will come up if you are going to take a test like the T's test in order to get into nursing school. It will also come up on a general biology basic genetics question that your teacher might give you. So let's explain the difference between monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. So a monohybrid cross, oops, I always picked the wrong pen, that one's dying. A monohybrid cross is one that is going to deal with just one trait. And in simple genetics, Mendelian genetics, a trait is associated with one gene. And that word mono is why we know it's one, right? And hybrid means that both parents are heterozygous for the trait that's being studied. Oops, zygous, sorry. And you can see that if this are, these are the egg options right here from the female, then the female would have a big R she could put in her eggs or a little R. Not both though, each according to the law of segregation that we already discussed in part two, each egg only gets one of these, it can't get both. And then the sperm, they each only get one, two. So the sperm options would be big R and little r as well. So you can see that both of these parents are hybrids. And then when they are crossed, a sperm fertilizes an egg, a sperm fertilizes an egg, a sperm fertilizes an egg, and a sperm fertilizes an egg, and you end up with this ratio that we've discussed in both part one and part two, I think. Um, the results of this monohybrid cross are that the F1 generation from these parents that are crossed will always display the three to one dominant phenotype. And in this case, the what we've been looking at are round versus wrinkled seeds. So notice that round seeds, round seeds, round seeds, and then wrinkled seeds. So one of the four offspring would have um, wrinkled seeds or display the recessive phenotype. Okay, now let's compare that with a dihybrid cross. So a dihybrid cross, in this case, do you see the word di means that we're gonna be looking at two traits or genes. And again, in Mendelian genetics, one gene is associated with one trait. And both parents are heterozygous for both traits. So what that would look like is that you would have a parent number one would be heterozygous for trait number one. Let's say we're looking at round seeds or seed shape and also heterozygous for a second trait that we're studying. Why don't we study uh, tall or short pea plants? So parent number one would be round seeds and a tall plant and that would be um, heterozygous for both and then crossed with another parent that is like that too. So both of the parents would have the same phenotype and genotype. They would be round seated and they would be tall. Do you see that? So now let's go ahead and cross those and see what happens. I'm going to use a pink and a blue pen so that you can see what's coming from the eggs and what's coming from the sperm. Now the way that they are sorted, see this word law of independent assortment, they are sorted into the eggs um, with equal probability that you'll have um, each allele pairing up with another allele. So what I mean by that is the one of the eggs would take the big R and the big T like this. And another of the eggs 
would take a big R and a little t, like this. And another one would take a little r and a big T. And this is the case where we can put a lowercase letter first. And then there would be some of the eggs that have little r and little t. Do you see how each combination is equally represented? That's what we mean by the law of independent assortment. The fact that there's not, it's not more likely that the big R and the big T will be together any more likely than that the little R and the little T. Each one is gonna be in an equal amount of eggs. So um, this is what we call the law of independent assortment. I'm gonna switch back to my black pen here. So even when studying two traits, All the alleles get separated. You could say sorted, sorted equally into the gametes. And remember, gametes are eggs and sperm. So all combinations. are equally represented in the gametes. And that is the law of independent assortment. So if we use the same law to sort the alleles from it, that the sperm could have, I'm gonna use a blue pen for this, Let's try this again. So we'll say the sperm options on this side of this big box. So we'll go big R, big T, big R, little t, little r, big t, and little r, little t. You might notice this is actually the same because they're both dihybrids, right? So these are the sperm options. And now we're ready for the real fun part. So let's go ahead and see what happens in the offspring here. So um, all I'm gonna I'm gonna do this column first, and I'm gonna just put show what, what all of the eggs would get. So I'm gonna do a big R and a big T, big R, big T, big R, big T, big R, big T. And then the sperm that fertilize these to make a plant. You'd have a big R, big T, big R, little T, little R, big T, little R, little T. You see that? Now when you look at these offspring, you see that this one, this plant, would be round and tall, round and tall, round and tall, round and tall. So four of all these 16 potential offspring will be round, and tall. Let's go ahead and color code those orange. So four are round and tall. One, two, three, four. Now let's see what happens in the next column. I'm gonna put the, um, the egg options right here again. So big R, little t, big R, little t, big R, little t, big R, little t. And let's see what happens with the sperm that fertilize these. Big R, big T, big R, little t, little r. Well, I guess I did that one wrong. You should it should have here. Should be like that. Little r, big T, and then little r, little t. I just like to have the capital one first. That's why I fixed that. So let's see. This one is round and tall. So make that orange. This one's round and short. You see that, little t, little t. Let's make that one green. This one is round and tall, so I'll make it orange. And this one is round and short, so I'll make that one green too. So now we figured out what half of the possible offspring would be like. So we've added two more round and tall so it looks like the dominant phenotype is still showing up more often, right? For both of the traits. 
and then these ones are round and short, right? And we'll color code those. These ones would be orange and these ones green. Okay, ready for the third column? Let's see what happens next. So we can go little r, big T, little r, big T, little r, big T, little r, big T, then take a blue pen, big R, big T, big R, little t, little r, big T, little r, little t, like that. Okay, so it looks like this one's round and tall. This one's round and tall. This one is short and tall. We haven't seen that before. And this one is short and tall. So two that are short and tall. Let's make those pink. Short and tall, short and tall. So it's like every phenotypical option is showing up, but in different numbers or ratios. So two more get added to the round and tall. So we're up to four, five, six, seven, eight of all of the, of the potential 16 in our box are gonna have the dominant phenotype for both traits. Make that orange. And then we have two that are, oh, did I call that short? I, sh I should have said wrinkled. Did I say wrinkled? I can't remember now what I said, but these would have wrinkled seeds and would be tall. So two that are wrinkled and tall. And I made those pink. So wrinkled seeds, tall. Sorry if I misspoke on that. Okay, now let's do the last column. We'll put in the what's going to be in the egg first. Like that. And then I'm going to figure out what happens when the sperm fertilize these eggs and we get baby plants. Big R, big T, big R, little T, little R, big T, little R, little T. Look at that one. It's homozygous recessive for both traits. Okay, so this one's round seeds, tall plant. There's our orange. Round seeds, short plant. So we did that in green. Let's see, wrinkled seeds, tall plant. We made that one pink. Looks like everything gets represented in this last column. Wrinkled seeds, short plant. Everything gets represented here. So we've got one more round and tall. We've got one round and short phenotype. We've got one wrinkled and tall phenotype. And we've got one wrinkled and short phenotype. So we'll go orange for this, green for the round and short, pink for the wrinkled and tall, and yellow for the homozygous recessive individual. So, when you look at this, you see a very specific ratio result from a dihybrid cross. So the offspring's phenotypical ratio will be nine of the, of the 16 will be display the dominant phenotype for both traits, so round and tall. And then you can see that three of them will display the dominant phenotype for the first trait and the recessive for the second trait, so that would be three, oops, three, are gonna be round and short, so that's dominant for the first trait, recessive for the second trait, make that green. And then there are going to be three that have the recessive form for the first trait and the dominant for the second, so we'll put three there, see, one, two, three, and make that one pink. Okay. 
and then just the itty bitty one is going to have the recessive phenotype for both traits. Now that is what we call the ratio of phenotypic results from a dye hybrid cross and I think you should have that memorized for the T's test or if you're going in to take a general biology um, basic genetics test in your class. So this is the offspring and we'll call this the phenotypic ratio from a dye hybrid cross. nine to three to three to one. Now, so do you see how up with the monohybrid cross, we get a ratio of three to one with the dominant to the recessive phenotype. And then for a dihybrid, because you have more phenotype options, you get nine to three to three to one. Okay, the last thing I wanna put over here is that in other inheritance patterns that are non-Mendelian, then there are linkages of traits. But simple Mendelian genetics does not address this. So I just want to put that in there because if you're a student of biology, you first learn the simple Mendelian genetics and then after that you start learning more about more complex patterns of inheritance. And it's all fascinating and hopefully you'll continue on in your studies and learn more about those other um, complex inheritance patterns too. All right, so we have finished um, my series on basic genetics. So this was just um, Mendelian genetics, and this was part three. So if you haven't watched part one and part two, you can go back and watch those. Uh, my website is um, sciencewithsusanna.com. And uh, what I do there is I put all my videos are there and then usually I have type notes that go along with it. I have Quizlet flashcards that go along with it and I have practice questions that go along with it. So you should you can find materials to study that take you all the way through anatomy and physiology, that take you all the way through general biology, and that take you all the way through microbiology. And then I do have some videos that are um, helpful for nursing students as well. So um, have a great day and thank you for joining me um, while we talked about basic genetics.